just to let you know as well that for access to the SFP, um, we've got a Facebook group and a new Instagram. So if you guys could give that a follow, that'd be great. That's how we're trying to advertise events. So we'll get started. So for this webinar, I just need to put out a disclaimer that, that the contents of this are based on my own experiences of um, the SFP interview and also the experiences of my friends around me who are doing interviews, um, who quite a few of us interviewed at different places. So this is just purely based on experiences and it's not endorsed by any specific university or deanery. So what we're going to go through today are so key dates for you to have in your diary, um, a bit about me, the interview structure in general, resources that are helpful to use, um, some key conditions to revise, and then we're going to do an A2E assessment um, with a case because uh, I'm aware that obviously you've probably done a lot of A2E assessments in medical school already. Um, so this one, we wanted to make it sort of case focused. Um, then we're going to talk a bit about escalation to seniors, um, some ethics questions, and then we'll have lots of time at the end, hopefully for questions. Um, but as I say, just pop them in, in the chat box. So in terms of key dates for you to have, um, so we've done about four um, webinars. This is the fifth one. Um, we've got two more after this uh, looking at interview tips so would recommend popping those in your diaries too um, the previous webinars have been uploaded to youtube our website's down at the moment but um, you can access all of them um, and re-watch if you haven't managed to join um, and then we've got mock interviews uh, that we're running from november to december ahead of the interviews um, and then some kind of more important dates for the diary so these are the ones that are published by the foundation program um, so we're in the middle of the application window at the moment. So if you haven't already thought about applying or applied to two different SFP posts, I really would recommend it. You've got nothing to lose. Um, I did that um, and I felt like it was good kind of interview practice. Um, so please do. Um, and I've put on a um, barcode here for you to have a look at the SFP website. So under the 2023 key documents, it's got the interview dates. So obviously, if you're planning on applying to somewhere specific, just make sure that you're free in, in between those dates and that you can schedule in revision and things. So a bit about me. So as I said, I'm Hannah. Um, I went to uni in Norwich at UEA um, and I did an intercalated MRes and I'm now in Sheffield. I'm an F2. Um, so I've done urology, respiratory and gastro rotations, and I'm currently on GP, hence why I have a random Sunday off. Um, and I'm doing my AFP block or SFP block, um, which is medical education at the end of this year. Um, so in terms of the interview structure, so all of the interviews that are being held um, this year are online, so it'll be via Zoom or Microsoft Teams. The only deanery that's not doing interviews is Yorkshire and Humber. So if you're considering applying to places like Leeds and Sheffield, um, they're not doing interviews. Um, you might already be aware of that. Um, and in terms of the broad kind of structure, it's very deanery specific um, and post specific. So it depends whether you're going for medical education or for um, the, uh, the research ones or um, le uh, leadership. But in terms of the three different parts that I would probably recommend preparing for, so number one, the clinical station, which we're doing today. Um, number two, critical appraisal. Um, I actually didn't have this in my interview for Yorkshire because um, I wasn't doing one of the research posts. Um, and number three is personal achievements. Um, you might not have a station on this. And um, it's just to bear in mind that each deanery is super different. So you might actually have a panel interview that combines different kind of aspects within this and there's no kind of defined clinical station or personal achievement station. Or you might have one that's super structured that's like 15 minutes on each part and it's like an OSCE. Um, mine actually was divided into two. So I had the clinical station uh, with a brief and then that lasted about, I think, 10 to 15 minutes. And then I had one about me and teaching experience. Um, so yeah, but I would recommend preparing for all three different parts. In terms of how I prepped for the interview, so everyone's gonna obviously have different ways of doing this. I know a lot of people um, will talk about things like the Oxford Handbook, et cetera, which I think um, it looks like a good resource. I didn't personally use it, to be honest, um, for finals revision or for the interview, um, because I found it quite difficult just reading from a small book. Um, so I kind of preferred using websites, I preferred using videos and things. So um, obviously this will be person specific, but I think, just general tips for the interview, you can obviously prepare alongside finals revision. You're revising the clinical scenarios anyway to make sure that you smash your OSCEs. Um, 
websites I would recommend. So OSCE Stop is really good for emergencies. I think it's quite concise. Um, Pulse Notes is also a good one. Um, I think they've got some videos on PSA um, and um, SJT and things, obviously. Um, they're, they're ones that you need to revise for as well. Um, and with Pulse Notes, I think you can get like a five pound membership um, and they tend to do yeah, different tutorials and things. Um, Resuscitation Council, I'll show you one of the what one of the videos looks like in a bit. Um, we're not going to watch it, but I would definitely recommend watching the A2E assessment um, for Resuscitation Council um, and also the ALS assessment. I sometimes still watch them before night shifts just to sort of revise drugs and things like that. Um, if I know that I'm on a crash team. Um, another one that I haven't really heard many other people do, but I actually found this really helpful when kind of things were drying up in terms of revision and I was lacking motivation. I would watch an episode of 24 hours in A&E or GPs behind closed doors. And if a patient came in with a certain presentation, I'd pause it and think, what are the differentials here? Um, and it just made revision a bit more fun, <laughs> if you can call it fun. Um, Past Med and Past Test would recommend Unofficial Guide to Radiology as a book. It's quite a meaty book. I'd recommend getting it out from a library. Um, I found it quite helpful for looking at chest x-rays, especially, you know, you might, you're going to have to do um, in investigation interpretation in this interview as well as finals. Um, other websites like Radiopedia, um, ABG Ninja is great. If you just need some practice at interpreting ABGs, you just go and do a load of them. Um, and then it kind of marks you whether you're right or not. Um, and Anki flashcards as well. So they're just flashcards, um, but they've got some built-in formula so that you can come back to ones that you haven't got right. Um, so that you're kind of doing all the active recall and spaced repetition, et cetera. Um, that's, what the 20, that's what GPs behind closed doors is like. It's on channel five. Um, these are resuscitation council videos. If you haven't watched them, um, some people do. We did ALS in med school. Um, some people do it in F1, F2. Um, but you have to watch these videos anyway then, but I would say that they're quite textbook for what you need to do for an A2B assessment. So I would recommend watching them a few times before your exams. Um, in terms of ideas for clinical topics, I've got some sort of um, headings here um, and you can go on to things like OSCE stop and have a look at the individual topics and, and revise them that way. Um, these ones I think tend to come up a bit more often. Um, the one that came up for me in Sheffield was DKA um, that I know obviously this is going to vary um, even within the deanery. So don't just listen to what other people get who are interviewing for the same deanery um, because they might have multiple different scenarios. Um, so in terms of the A2E approach, as I said, obviously, you've probably all done it in med school a lot of times before. Um, so I'm not just going to go through how to do an A2E. Um, I'm going to try and involve it with a case and I hope that all the animations on this work. Um, but some general tips for, a, for kind of the A to E clinical station are to remember that you're an F1. So um, in these uh, stations, you probably get a brief beforehand that will say you are the F1 or a medical student, usually the F1 um, on a ward and they'll tell you what you're covering, et cetera. Um, and it's to remember that you're not being allocated the role of the medreg. So you have to remember that as an F1, you're not being asked to fix all of the problems that a patient has. You're being asked to go and gather some information. You're being asked to sort of initiate some, some kind of management, basic management um, of a condition and then go and escalate to a senior. So you might have no idea what's causing their low blood pressure, but you just need to recognize that they have low blood pressure, give them some fluids and then speak to someone um, more senior. Um, you need to be systematic with it. I know, obviously, that's the whole reason of doing it in this way, A to E, but it's not just because they fit into the categories fit into the acronym. It's because obviously you're triaging things. So an airway problem is going to be more of an, an immediate issue than breathing. So it's just to remember that the system works and just to go through it like that. Um, and to remember to be clear with communication. So um, I would definitely recommend, you know, saying things that sound a bit obvious to you. Um, so don't try and just do all of your thinking in your head. Say it out loud and say, this patient sounds unwell. I'm concerned. I'm going to do an A to E assessment because it shows the examiners that you're sort of signposting like we do in communication skills. You'll never be wrong if you say fellow local trust guidelines, um, especially with management, things like antibiotics. Um, it shows that you're kind of following um, guidance, um, local guidance, and you, you know, you're applying for an SFP, um, which is academic, so they want you to follow guidelines, essentially. Um, if you ask for an investigation, if you say, oh, I want an ABG, 
get ready to interpret it because they might give you the results as soon as you said it, um, which we're not really used to when we're practicing doing an A to B with our friends and things. I remember just saying I would do this, 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 and then they're like, okay, you've done it. Here's the results. So you have to get in the mindset that you're, you're going to be given the results. Um, and just to know some scoring systems as well, you don't need to know, you know, really specific ones, but ones that have come up a lot in med school, things like uh, Wells for DBTPE, things like Glasgow Blatchford score. Um, these are evidence based scoring systems. So, again, it's just showing that you're kind of the sort of person that is more interested in academia and, and evidence based stuff. So, um, I mean, so I'm going to talk a bit about a quick a quick history taking this is obviously if it's not a peri arrest situation where you need to go in and quickly you know um just crack on with the a2 assessment um this is if you've got a bit of time if the patient's talking and if you can find out a few bits of information um so some people use the sample acronym and um, if you know what any of these categories are then please feel free to write in the chat um but we'll go through it so the S stands for signs and symptoms. So when you're initially kind of approaching, it's okay to ask, um, you know, to the patient, how are you doing? Because a lot of the time the interview will be acting as if they are the patient. Um, so you speak to them as if they are. Um, and then to check for things like allergies, particularly with, again, antibiotic prescribing and um, medications, because especially if the scenario involves something like an AKI, there's going to be drugs that you can stop as well. So it's showing that you're thinking about the whole picture rather than just the sort of immediate management. Um, past medical history obviously is important. If it sounds like something surgical, um, an acute abdomen, you know, an orthopedic sort of problem, um, it probably would be a good idea to ask about last, last oral intake if they're going to need surgery um, and thinking about the events that are leading up to the illness. So really with the kind of A to E assessment and being given a brief, you need to start acting like a detective from the minute that you get the brief. So um, they might say, you know, read through this for a couple of minutes, or they might just crack on with the scenario. But each time you get a piece of information, just think about what they're trying to hint at. So if you get given some information, you know, with some patient demographics, think about the patient's age. If it's a 20 year old who's presenting with a breathing problem, it's not likely to be something like an, a COPD exacerbation, probably unlikely to be a lung cancer. Um, so start, you know, sort of whittling down your diagnoses based on that. If they say that they're in a surgical unit, are they trying to hint that the patient's immobile and at more risk of having a blood clot? And to use a systems-based approach. So if they say something like, um, you know, the patient's feeling short of breath, then you've already got a small piece of information that you can then say, okay, right, which systems could be involved? Could it be respiratory? Could it be cardiovascular with heart failure? Could it be anxiety? Um, and to think of differentials and try to the whole time just be finding information that kind of backs up certain diagnoses and refutes others. And then a question that I always tend to find quite helpful to ask myself is what would a patient with severe COPD look like? Because then you already have an idea in your head of what you're looking for. Um, so you're going into the situation expecting to find things that are abnormal. So the key structure of, so within A to E, going A, B, C, D, E, um, you want to do this generally. Um, so the first part is going to be the actual examination. So it's always good to obviously ask for some observations. And then the same as any exam in med school, look, listen, feel. We're going to do some investigations and management. And then you just need to summarize it properly so that you don't get lost in the whole A to E assessment. There's lots of information kind of coming out. Um, you're asking lots of questions. It's good just to take some time at the end of each section just to say, this is what I've found. Um, and then to continually go back and reassess previous sections. So if in breathing, you started some oxygen, you need to go back and just double check, okay, have their SATs gone up? Because otherwise you're not checking that anything we're doing is working. So we're gonna do a case. Um, I don't know whether you guys feel like getting involved. If you do, then um, I'll ask some questions. Please pop your answers in the chat. I feel like you'll get more out of it this way. So. You're on a night shift, you're on F1 and you get a bleep. So they say, hi, I'm a nurse on Brilli 6. One of the Jerry's patients in C-Bay has had a fall. I need you to come and assess him urgently. So can you guys write in the chat, what are you gonna say back? 
and I'll get um, Maya or Eamon to shout out some responses because I can't see. So someone said, um, can you tell me a little bit more about their patients? What are their odds, GCS, um, S bar, essentially? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, that's not a good. Uh, that's not a bad place to start. Um, I think probably on a night shift. I don't know how realistic it would be to get an S bar from a nurse, but I think um, it is. You know, we should really be handing over in this way. Um, anything else that we might want to know? So we've asked about the patient's details. We've asked about OBS and things. Some people have put in um, kind of related to it, but just saying: is he is the patient conscious? Is there any blood on the floor? Um, and maybe like a U score, if yeah. nothing else, um, past medical history and reason for admission. Yeah, that's really good. Um, that is that is actually a good one that I, I haven't put in here, but reason for admission um, can be very helpful because then you, you know, if it's somebody who's got an upper GI bleed and they've had an upper GI bleed two days before, um, then, and then you can sort of start to build a picture about what is happening with this patient. Um, so I say, what is the patient's name and hospital number? then they give it to us. And the next thing, is he alert and talking to you? Because, you know, when you're talking over the phone, I think we, I tended to, when I started F1, I thought about the worst case scenario that might happen. I would imagine people being completely out of it when I got there. And, um, but actually there's quite a big difference from this guy sitting on the floor, having a nice time, and this guy um, who's had a fall. So um, we need to clarify that. So she says, um, yes, he or she says, yes, he's alert, screaming out in pain. So we ask for some OBS, they say, oh, we haven't managed to do any yet. So then your handover list is looking a bit like this and you're looking a bit like this. And you say, I'm gonna come and review him in 10 minutes. Can you get some OBS done now? Um, if he hasn't got a cannula, can anyone on the ward do cannulas? Because in this sort of situation, this is kind of what happened in my Yorkshire interview. Um, they kind of presented me with um, a handover essentially from um from a nurse and um i had the opportunity to ask for things before i got there um so obviously if they do give you some obs and if they've got a um tachycardia um or something like that then you can start to say you know is anyone able to do ecgs and things if they say no then okay fine you can do them when you get there but it's good to sort of be thinking a couple of steps ahead so they say no one's trained to do cannulas classic and he hasn't got one he's supposed to be med medically fit for discharge going home tomorrow Okay, so this is our patient. So it's Gerard Wilson. He's um, Gerald Wilson. He's in C4. Um, he's a Jerry's patient. Um, he's uh, had a fall whilst he's been wandering in his room. He's complaining of pain. Um, he was admitted from a care home with an AKI secondary to dehydration. So they give us a bit of past medical history when we get there. So um, he's got COPD. Um, he's got AF and he's got metastatic prostate cancer. Um, and importantly, he has a DNAR as well. Um, that's always a good one to um, to ask when you're getting the initial handover from nurses as well, um, just in case you know you rock up and then the arrest um, bell goes. Um, and then in terms of meds, so um, on some inhalers, bisoprolol for his AF and a pixaban as well. Um, so it's just important to sort of bear these in mind. Um, try and build up a picture of the patient. Are we gonna be having to stop any of these meds, for example? And then you see a bit of a gash um, on his head. So immediately we're thinking, hmm, this is an old person who's had a fall um, and they've, they're on a Pixaban and they've got a nasty gash to their head. Um, we should probably be stopping about, uh, thinking about stopping that. So in terms of airway, I want you guys to write some stuff in the chat. Um, what, so picture you know, me as the, the interviewer you guys are in the station and they say, okay, um, off you go with your A2 assessment. What are you going to ask me? Write some stuff in the chat. We're trying to ascertain if they've got a patent airway. So some people have said, is the patient talking? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else? Are they making any sounds like any audible stride or? Yeah. So what does audible stride or mean as opposed to something like a wheeze? It 
So if someone said um, stridor is like obstruction in upper airway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, so we're going to say things like added sounds, like you said. Um, are there any obstructions that we can see or any secretions? Just try to think about the things that you can do as an F1. So you can do suction if you can see that there are secretions there. Um, and bearing in mind that, obviously, as we said earlier with A2E, airway is the most kind of life-threatening problem. If you think there's an airway emergency, you need to start acting and you need to um, put out a 2222 call, um, which is the kind of internal medical number for the arrest team because you need an anaesthetist there if you're super worried. Um, if they do have things like stridor, what can we do as F1s um, to try and deal with that? So people are saying, um, consider things like suctioning, head tilt, chin lift, inserting an airway. Yeah, perfect. Oxygen as well. Um, and think about um, obvious barriers to um, doing different maneuvers. So with the head tilt, chin lift, you have to be careful in patients who have C-spine injuries. Um, also just making sure that if you're gonna be inserting things like nasopharyngeal airways, um, that the patient doesn't have an obvious or known uh, base of skull fracture, um, for example. So you ask these questions and then um, when you ask them, then the interviewer will say, Gerald is crying out in pain. Um, there's no added noises, no obstruction, secretions, etc. These are some pictures of some airways. So you know that you know that his airways patient, so we can move on. So breathing. So we're going to ask what is his respiratory rate and SATs. So we said earlier that as part of the examination, it's observations and then it's looking, um, feeling, listening. So for looking, we're going to be looking at signs of cyanosis. Is the patient using accessory muscles or showing signs of respiratory distress? Is the trachea central, chest expanding equally bilaterally? And finally, for listening, and um, what can be heard on auscultation and percussion? So it does it does seem like it's quite a simulated situation because obviously you're sitting on Zoom with an interviewer and you don't have the sim man right there, but it's just thinking about um, you know, picturing the patient. How do you tend to do things um, when you're doing A2E assessments on sim mans, sim sim men, <laughs> and try and try and do it that way. Um, so then they say, okay, his SATs are 86%, his respiratory rate is 22, and there's no signs of cyanosis. He does have some accessory muscle usage. Um, his trachea is central with equal chest expansion, and he's got some crackles on his right base with no wheeze. Percussion sounds normal. So what are we going to do? Write some things in the chat. So we've got some suggestions of an ABG or a VBG and a chest X-ray. Yeah. Applying some oxygen, like five litres for a trauma mask. Yeah. So I think in this sort of scenario, obviously order, you can request a chest X-ray, but it's not going to be happening, you know, for, for at least sort of like 10 minutes, even if it was, even if they were running up um, with the chest X-ray machine and doing, doing a um, portable one. Um, so you need to do the things that, you know, need to be done immediately. So with this patient, they have SATs of 86%, you need to put on some oxygen. But there is something that we need to just bear in mind from the beginning of the scenario. So we know that this patient has a background of COPD. So does that change what we're doing in terms of applying oxygen? Would you still apply oxygen and how much would you give if you write in the chat? So um, we've got people saying that you'd still apply the oxygen, 15 litres non-rebreathe, but just be cautious. Yeah. So, so say, for example, if we did that, what kind of signs are we looking out for in a patient that, you know, they might be retaining that it's, that it's getting to dangerous levels? What sorts of things can you notice? Looking tired. Um, Someone said VCG, I'm not too sure what that is. Um, ABG result, oh, sorry, okay, ABG yeah. results. Okay, 
Um, yeah, so um, if somebody, if we think that they're starting to retain, then people can become um, quite drowsy, actually, and quite confused. Um, and it, this can happen really quite acutely as well. Um, so you'll notice that even, you know, within sort of minutes of weaning down the oxygen um, to, to try and get them within their target levels, that can actually um, sort of reverse all of the confusion that they have. Um, so, yeah, I agree with what you say. I think we need to apply 15 litres of non uh, 15 litres non rebreathe mask, um, and that's because hypoxia is going to kill first um, compared to type 2 respiratory failure. So, yeah, you're going to apply some oxygen, as we said, request a chest x ray and do an ABG. So, then, as we said, they will give you the investigation results immediately. So, they've done an ABG. So, I want you guys to have a look at this um, and have a go at interpreting it. I'm going to give you a minute or so because obviously there's quite a lot of results, but um, try to come up with your idea of what's going on and write it in the chat. If, if you're not sure, then that's okay. But just pop anything in the chat that you think, hmm, that looks quite abnormal. So we've got some answers coming in. So we've got someone, some people saying compensated respiratory acidosis and that the lactate would be raised, PO2 low, possibly a metabolic acidosis for respiratory compensation. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So, um, so looking at the ABG results, so you can, it's, it's good kind of to go through it methodically um, as if you would in an OSCE. So the way that I would kind of go through this and say, okay, the pH is within the normal range. Um, this is just to highlight that sometimes um, they won't give you the um, ranges as well. So it's a good um, sort of learning point learn your ranges for things like ABGs um, because it's helpful as an F1 as well. Some of the, some of the machines don't actually give you them. Um, so it's 7.35 to 7.45 usually for pH. So it's kind of borderline um, looking like it might go acidotic. Um, with the PO2, we think, okay, nine isn't actually too bad if normal is between sort of 10 and 13. But actually, if we have a look at the FiO2, this patient's on 15 litres of, um, of oxygen. So it should be much higher than that. So that's relative kind of hypoxia. Um, with the PCO2, so usually above sort of like six would be um, retaining. So actually that's that's okay at the moment, but the, the bicarbonate is low. So um, could that be the cause of things? And then looking at the other results, um, sodium and potassium look okay. A glucose of nine is not concerning, um, but a lactate of four is definitely concerning. Um, so we'd be thinking here, hmm, what's going on? Um, we can see from examining the patient that they've got some crackles in their right base um we know that lactate can be a, a sign of sepsis what's going on here um, and we've requested a chest x-ray so always good at the end of each section to kind of summarize what's happened or what you found if i can click yeah so as a summary um what i would say here is that there's um kind of relative hypoxia on a background of copd um we know so we we are told by the by the interviewer that this patient's a known retainer so the way to check that out is to have a look at previous abg results so they tell us that this patient um has had previous type 2 respiratory failure um and i'd say this is compensated metabolic acidosis with a raised lactate could sepsis be causing this and could there be a pneumonia well we're still waiting for the chest x-ray so we don't know yet but um we've definitely heard crackles so um that's something that we're considering so in terms of circulation we're going to do the same thing again so um for breathing we looked at observations first um and then we did look feel listen so what kind of things you can pop in the chat i'm going to i'm going to go along with it but please feel free to write your answers in what sort of things we'll be asking about in a in a circulation assessment so we've got heart rate and blood pressure the main ones um i would look for edema check mucous membranes and jvp so this is kind of incorporating a fluid status assessment within the circulation one you're going to be feeling for temperature checking capillary refill time 
and also not just relying on the heart rate that the nurse um, gives you, you know, actually feeling um, for yourself the rate, rhythm and character and also listening to heart sounds and um, checking fluid charts. So that's an important part of doing a fluid status assessment. Some people will do this in D. Um, I tended to do it in circulation just because um, if someone's overloaded, that's clearly, that's usually a circulatory problem. Um, so yeah, it's a good one to check in this one. So then they tell you heart rate is 120, blood pressure is um, 108 over 68. So it's a little bit low. Um, heart rate tends to go up first though. And then we have, um, you know, no edema, mucous membranes are dry, JVP is normal. And they're saying that the patient feels very warm. So they, they are febrile um, with a slightly sluggish capillary refill time of three seconds. So with the pulse, um, it's irregularly irregular. If we remember from the start of the scenario, the patient has AF, um, they're on bisoprolol and apixaban, um, normal character. They've said the fluid balance chart isn't filled in today, which is also classic. Um, but the patient is passing urine. Okay, fine. Um, so we think here that we'd like to do an ECG because they are tachycardic and we want to just confirm that um, the irregularly irregular pulse is AF and that there isn't something else um, that's going on causing that tachycardia. Um, you want to insert two grey cannulas into the anticubital fossas and take some bloods from them. Um, you'll never be wrong um, if you kind of do standard bloods like FBC, Eugenies, LFTs. So don't just say bloods, give exactly what you're going to be doing. In this situation, um, I haven't written VBG here because we've already got an ABG from breathing. Um, but I will ask for things like clotting, group and save and cultures um, because we don't really know what's going on here and what's causing the heart rate to be so high. Um, and then I would say I would pre prescribe some fluids um, and initiate the sepsis six. So fluids within that really. So then they say, okay, um, you've got an ECG. They might show you an ECG for you and you to interpret, or they might just tell you um, the patient's in fast AF. So um, in terms of fast AF, um, what are we going to do? Are we going to try and pop up, pop up the dose of their bisoprolol? Um, or what, what might we do first? We've got any answers? No one's posted in the chat. No. That's So, oh. oh, some people have said, um, like, deal with the sepsis first. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you need to think about uh, like all of the different causes for tachycardia. In this case, um, the fact that they have dry mucous membranes as well, and the fact that we're querying sepsis, we're looking at potentially them being a bit dehydrated. So that can push up your heart rate as well. So you don't just jump to rate control and things, even if they have fast AF, you start thinking, is there something else going on here? Um, and then they tell you they've sent off the bloods. I think they quite like saying, oh, we've sent off the investigations, but we don't have them back yet because they want to prompt you to ask for them again. Um, you can say things like, um, can you let me know when they're back? But I would just say from experience, they might not actually tell you when they're back. So it's, you need to sort of remember at the end of each step to go back if there was something that was abnormal in the last one, just double check. So as a summary from circulation, we would say, okay, this patient has known AF, um, they're in fast AF currently, um, they have signs of dehydration, they're also febrile, um, so we're querying sepsis here. Um, so then you would, they might ask a bit more about what you would do within the sepsis six, and there's the acronym BUFFALO to help you remember. Um, so yes, so we've, we've kind of gotten to the end here, now what do we need to do? reassess yeah so reassess so let's say so we go back to breathing sorry if you can hear someone revving outside i'm not really sure why they're doing that um so we go back to breathing um and what specifically are we what specifically are we reassessing people are saying um the oxygen starts and the respiratory rate yeah. Um, and we've also sent off for a chest x-ray and not had that back yet. So, I mean, they might say, no, you've only done circulation. It's obviously not, it's still not back, um, which is fine. But at least you're showing them, you're remembering that there's something that you've asked them to do that's not 
you know, that you're, that you're waiting for. Um, so surprisingly, the chest X-ray has been done very quickly and um, it comes back and you see that there is some consolidation on the right hand side there, which matches up with what you heard as well. Um, so we're querying a right lower lobe pneumonia. And then we recheck the oxygen saturations. And since we put on the 15 litres, the SATs are now 94%. Um, so bearing in mind that we know that this patient is a previous retainer um, and the nurse tells you, oh, their target saturations are 88 to 92%. Um, we're going to tell them to pop the oxygen um, down to a 40% red venturi. Um, I don't know whether you need to know the colours of different venturis, um, but probably not um but you can if you want to it just shows that you've obviously revised your respiratory stuff and um, we use venturis in copd patients um with uh, uh co2 retention just because uh it gives you a more accurate idea of how much um, oxygen you're delivering so disability so what kind of things are we going to ask in this section this one's a bit less obvious than the breathing and circulation ones We've got a uh, GCS, temperature, glucose, um, pupils, AFPU. Yeah, perfect. So um, what is this GCS? Um, pupils, it's good to check for the size as well, um, just because if they've got pinpoint pupils, that could um, potentially suggest like opioid overdose, for example. Um, please, can we take a cap glucose measurement? And what is the temperature? I think we already had the temperature from the last one, but it's just to remember that if you haven't already asked for it, um, ask it here. So um, AVPU, so remember to put the C in AVPU because they've changed it so that C is confusion. Um, I would recommend probably doing a GCS. I think it makes it um, much um, easier to kind of when you're the F1 on nights and you go back through documentation, um, it does make it easier if people show you exactly what they've rated in each category um, because then you know whether there's been a change from normal. So here they've put voice as four, um, which is usually that the patient's confused. Um, you would start thinking about a kind of an airway, um, an airway at risk when their GCS is sort of like eight or blue. Um, so they say that the, the pupils are equal and reactive to light, pearl, um, and that they're four millimeters, which is fine. And their blood sugar, like we had on the um, ABG, is 9.6, so it's fine. Um, temperature, we know that they're febrile. So what are we going to say now? So they're, they're kind of we know that they're sort of confused. We're not really sure why they don't have a background of dementia from what we know in the scenario, but they could have delirium. Um, why did they have the fall in the first place um, is a question that we need to consider. Um, they're also febrile. So um, we've got some blood test results back. So I'm gonna show you them and ask you to sort of interpret. And I've put them in the colors that the bottles are in my trust. This might be different in different trusts. So if you can write in the chat which bits you think are abnormal. We've got a uh, clotting, uh, the AKI result, the CRP, Yeah, so with the clotting, are we surprised that, that that's off? Are we worried about that? No, because he's on a Pixaban. Yeah, so that's it's going to be um, likely off in that anyway. Um, but, you know, if the patient wasn't on any um, anticoagulants and they had a rising heart rate, for example, um, with um, deranged clotting results, then you would be worried about things like bleeding. Um, but here we can see that they have um, anemia and it's an enormousitic anemia. Um, it looks as if it's quite stable actually at the moment. Um, white cell count, so we know that it's a neutrophilia here. So you'd be worried about things like infection, especially given the fact that there's been that um, CRP rise. The most important thing is to look at trends in terms of blood results, because often on night shifts, I'll have a look at um, people's blood results. And I think, oh gosh, they're very abnormal. Um, but then you actually see that there's not really been that much change from baseline. Um, and it might have something to do with all of the other conditions they have. Um, interestingly here, they've got a raised ALP. Um, what kind of things can raise your ALP? The other liver function tests are normal. 
So someone said bone mets due to prostate cancer. Yeah, good. Anything else? I mean, it's in the liver function test, so it, it, it can be because your liver's, um, it can be like the cholestatic um, deranged liver function tests. Um, if there's something, for example, blocking bile outflow, um, and it also can be raised in things like pregnancy. So as a summary, we've got a stable normocytic anemia. We've got um, signs of infection with their raised, raised white cell count, CRP. Uh, we've got an AKI here, given the fact they have sepsis as well. Um, they've got this raised ALP, which probably in this scenario is probably not an acute thing. Um, and their clotting's off. Um, I've written a river oxaban there, but I think I said a fixed band earlier. And then in terms of exposure, just in the interest of time, um, we would examine his abdomen, um, check bowel sounds and do a top to toe examination of skin to look for lacerations and bruising, especially given the fact that he's had a fall. Um, you want to check output from all drains and catheters as well. Um, make sure that you examine long bones and C-spine um, in falls patients. So I usually just have a feel of the greater trochanters, just have a feel of their sort of like long bones, just double check they can sort of move their limbs properly um, and just have a feel down the back of their neck as well. Um, and just send an MSU because um, it's just part of the septic screen. So you, you mainly want to be looking for a respiratory source, which we already kind of have evidence for. Well, we do, we've got a pneumonia um, and also for urine. So they tell you that abdomen's fine and um, they've got a head laceration, um, no drains or catheters, but they've got pain on palpation of their right greater trochanter. So that's something to bear in mind. So we've got that there. And then as part of finishing touches, so that's kind of the end of the A2E. And I appreciate there's a lot of things that I put in that um, just to kind of highlight the different areas they can um, it's, it's usually a multifaceted sort of situation where there's lots of things going on for you to consider and try and tie it into what's going on. But things to bear in mind for finishing touches. So you want to kind of summarize what you've found in general. So in this patient, you would say, okay, looks like there's a, a pneumonia that's caused a sepsis there. This is a patient that's got an AKI. He's also um, got a laceration on his head. So query head injury um, and also pain in his hip. So does he have a hip fracture too? Um, and then the next thing will be to escalate to your senior. So we've done what we can. We've, we've been and we've collected all the information. We've started some initial management, but we need to go and get um, a senior involved. Additional tests. Um, here with a head injury, we're thinking about a CT head um, and also the fact that they've got this pain in their hip um, whilst they're down um, having their CT head, we can always ask them to have an X-ray as well. Um, drug history and prescribe remembering to say in your interviews that you're prescribing oxygen. People commonly forget that, um, but I think it's a good uh, touch. And then taking a full history, especially in a falls history, you need to be not only chatting to the patient about what happened, but also anyone that was there that witnessed it, because that will be a key part of your documentation. Um, and then lastly, you need to update the nurses. I've written plus minus family. If you're on an on-call shift and someone has a fall, but they're not sort of acutely, acutely deteriorating, likely to die, um, the nurses might be happy to update the family in the morning, but you probably wouldn't ring someone at 3 a.m. unless you were very concerned about them. So um, lastly, so I'm aware of time, um, with, with kind of an S-bar handover, so you guys, I'm sure you've probably heard of this. So it's escalating to seniors. So we're just gonna go through this. So you've got your different subheadings, so situation, background, assessment, and recommendation. So in situation, you're essentially just saying, who am I, who is the patient, and what am I asking for? So I would say, I'm Hannah, I'm the on-call F1 covering Brearley. Um, I'm calling about a patient called Gerald Wilson and C4 on Brearley 6, um, who I got called to assess after a fall, and I'm concerned has respiratory sepsis, an AKI with um, head slash hip injuries. Um, would you be able to come and review him? Really important to actually clearly communicate what you're asking from them because it might just be that you're asking for some advice, um, but they just need to, they need to know from the outset um, what you're asking because the med regs are super busy at night. Then as part of background, so it'll be what we found out about the patient initially. So kind of their past medical history, um, really helpful for them to know when they were admitted. Is this the type of patient that's had loads and loads of falls? They've been in for like two months or did they get admitted yesterday? Um, and then just good to give them an idea they've had a fall with a head and a hip injury. You would say what you found on your assessment. So OBS have improved from earlier and are currently this. 
and that you've done an A2E assessment and found this. And then in terms of recommendation, um, as, as well as kind of asking them, you know, could you come and review them? What else do we need to do? So we need to, oh, as people said. Someone suggested doing a CT head or an X-ray of the pelvis, if you think there might be problems there or considering the ceiling of care. Yeah, that's it. That's a good point. So you, you're, you're not just asking them for their help, but you're also just saying, what else can I do to help in the interim? So it's always a good thing to say what you've done. So we've prescribed the sepsis six here. We've, we've stopped his DOAC, for example. I've requested these different investigations. He's waiting for them. Um, would you be able to come and review him? Is there anything that you want me to do in the meantime? Um, and that's that's kind of how an S bar should be. Um, it should be quite concise as well, um, because obviously they, they don't want to listen to sort of loads about the history for like five, 10 minutes. You just want to get on with it. What are you asking them to do? What have you found? Um, yeah. And then um, just um, finally, um, there, there can be ethics questions involved. I personally didn't experience this, but I have looked at some of the different topics that can come up quite commonly. So these include things like capacity, um, so i.e. patient trying to leave the ward. So they might say, okay, well, um, you know, Gerald has now refused treatment. Um, how would you approach this as an F1? Um, and expect you to kind of um, go, go through that. Um, sometimes contraception, I think, obviously not applicable in this scenario, but um, could potentially be involved, I don't know. Um, patient confidentiality as well what if a relative rings up or someone that you're not sure if they how well they know the patient they're asking for updates and things um so it's just um trying to think of how you would approach those questions um mistakes as well specifically drug errors um are a big one and just bearing in mind that with ethics questions um you go back to what we did for applying to med school and that's looking at the four different pillars um within ethics so um yeah this I'm sure that you guys are aware of these um, so in this scenario if they ring you up and they say hi I'm calling about the same patient he's trying to leave the ward I need you to do a capacity assessment um, that's something that you'll commonly get asked to do as an F1 and um, people will often say especially at board rounds we need a, a capacity assessment um, and really specific here um, and important is to ask for what the decision why are we assessing capacity um, it's it's decision specific so we need to know is it capacity in this situation for him leaving the ward or is it capacity for other things like care um, for being able to make decisions about other aspects of their treatment um, so just important to stress that you know that so what do you do so you turn up and you want to assess capacity on him um, when I was on psychiatry, one of the psychiatrists actually gave me this sort of saying, and I have found it, I've always found that it stayed with me. Um, so he said, um, you are with capacity, and it's because each of them stand for obviously the different sections, um, but it's kind of in the right order for the way that you do it. And also um, it assumes that the patient has capacity unless um, there's any evidence that they don't. Um, so how in this scenario would we approach this? So we're on, we've gone back to the ward, um, Gerald's lying in, in bed, you know, he's getting really frustrated. He's saying that he's leaving. Um, what would you guys do? So Someone got, suggested. Oh, go on, go on, Antonia. <laughs> Um, so someone's just doing kind of like asking why he wants to leave or checking the four principles and if in doubt kind of call a senior asking him what the consequences of leaving would be as well yeah nice and um, so yeah I'd say, I'd say the most important thing is just double check with the patient why are they trying to leave is it that they don't understand why they're in hospital because if you know it just takes you explaining why they're there for them to understand um, and then accept it um, then that's obviously much better than kind of bulldozing in and, and, and saying loads of risks at them and things like that. So just try to um, reassure them, especially if they are delirious and, you know, it's a worrying time, they're old, they're, they've had a fall, things are scary. Um, just try to be reassuring and just double check why is it that they want to leave. 
then if they say, I don't know, he wants to go home and see his friend, something like that, um, then you could ask, so you could go and tell him the risks essentially and say, you know, I'm worried that if you leave in your current condition, your oxygen levels may drop dangerously low and we won't be able to treat them um, effectively um, or, your, or your infection. So there's a risk that you could die. Um, and it's really important here to remember to include the word die as harsh as it sounds. Um, it's something that we need to write down when we're documenting, especially with situations like this where he actually could die. Um, you need to make sure that you've actually explicitly said the word. Um, then after that, you have given quite a lot of information. So you just need to double check if they need anything explaining. And then if they say, no, I understand, but I just want to go home and see my friend or whatever, then you would need to ask, OK, I need, I'm going to need you to re repeat back to me the risks of you leaving hospital. And that's to show that they have retained the information that you've gave them or that you've given them. And then after that, you just need to say, um, do you still want to leave despite these risks? Um, and if they're not able to kind of effectively weigh up and, and state some of the risks that you've said, um, then they're not kind of showing evidence of being able to retain the information that you've given them. Um, so this is quite a classic scenario where you would then need to say this patient doesn't have capacity and document it in the notes and then the nurses um, or yourself would be able to fill out a DOLS or a depri deprivation of liberty safeguard form which essentially means that we um, the patient needs to stay on the ward and if they try to leave um, then we would kind of be able to call security and, and um, ensure that they stay there um, which can be quite it can be quite difficult and sad um, but obviously important for their safety. So in summary, because I know we've gone through loads there, um, we've covered lots about kind of A2E assessments with that case, um, given some ideas from other, for some other topics for you to revise. We've looked a bit about SBAR handovers and just briefly at capacity assessments there. Um, so I hope that was helpful. Um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask now. And I'm sure that Maya and um, Eamon can also help to answer if um, there's anything. And before everybody goes, please could you um, fill out the feedback? I will show you the next slide. It's got a QR 